This podcast is part of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network. Biblical Christianity's marketplace of ideas. BibleThumpingWingnut.com Hello and you're listening to Polemics Report for May 29, 2019. This is your host, J.D. Hall. This is the program we hope will be glorifying to God, convicting the sinners, and edifying to the saints, a program with sincere questions and biblical answers. Thanks so much for listening in. By the way, do you have a sincere question and do you desire a biblical answer? Find a, find a local church. Be a church member somewhere. Quit, quit being such a pagan. Put your name on a church roll. It's just a piece of paper. It's more than a piece of paper, critical voice in my head. It means commitment. It means family. It means koinonia fellowship. These things are all important. So the best place to get your sincere questions answered with uh, biblical answers is your local church. But if that fails you, then send us an email, jd at pulpitandpin.org, and we'll answer the question to the best of our ability, and I might even read it on the air. Thanks for supporting us over at Patreon. You can give $5.95 a month, $34.95 a month, or $49.95 a month for different levels of gifts. And by gifts, I mean stuff that we give you to bribe you to give us money. Because <clears throat> believe it or not, there are not always sponsors who want to be associated with the kind of work that we do. And so we had some of our ad sponsors uh, cut out from underneath us uh, because of the social justice warriors over at the Gospel Coalition and Kyle J. Howard calling for a boycott. So we do rely on our Patreon subscribers. And by the way, if you support us, your first month you'll get five theolo uh, theology books. And after that, one or two a month, every single month from Crown and Cross Books in Indiana a great resource. And uh, again, thank you to our sponsors, Crown and Cross Books, the Reformed Gear Store. And if you're listening, you're listening on the Bible Thumping Wingnut. Also, I, I have a new sponsor. Hold on a second. I'm supposed to be advertising something else. Give me a second and I'll tell you because you want to know about it. We are advertising the Metropolitan Tabernacle of London, their School of Theology. Tuesday the 2nd through Thursday the 4th of July, the theme is the true dynamism of the local church. It is a conference for pastors, Christian workers, and students. Again, the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Uh, that is uh, Spurgeon's church, pastored by the venerable... No, I shouldn't use that word. Uh, it's, it's, it smells Catholic. Um, the, honor, the honorable, the reverend uh, the pastor, Peter Masters, uh, wonderful human being, uh, I hope to one day get there. And so if you are over the pond or would like to go, the Metropolitan Tabernacle London School of Theology, Tuesday the 2nd through Thursday, Thursday the 4th of July, the true dynamism of the local church. Uh, we have a few different news topics to get to today, so let's go to uh, numero uno. Uh, there we go. Why the SBC should say no more to Beth Moore, this has caused quite a stir in the blogosphere out there because Josh Bice, the, uh, the G3 uh, coordinator, who seems like a fine, fine human being, wrote a post in which he said why the SBC should say no more to Beth Moore, and it's got quite the attention from people who don't like it in particular. How dare you, sir? Tell us something that pulpit and pen has been saying for 10 years. And so Josh Bice wrote this. And I just, before I, th I cast shade, before I throw out shade, let me say it's actually a very good uh, article. It's actually quite good. And it talked about her Twitter response to Owen Strahan. Is it Strahan? Strahan? Uh, Strahan? 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 I don't know. He's the former president of the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. I believe he's now employed at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he's a senior fellow at the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Uh, he discussed, that is, Bice discussed Moore's exchange with Owen uh, on the divine order in a chaotic age on women preaching, in which Owen was basically like, mm, I'm going to stand over here with biblical orthodoxy and say that women shouldn't be preaching to the gathered Lord's Day. Assembly and Owen's the nicest guy. How about this? Women shouldn't be talking uh, if it requires the spotlight on the stage at if at any point in the gathered assembly, whether or not 
it's the Lord's Day. I'm just going to go full like 20th century on you because that's how we used to define complementarianism, but now it's gotten a little bit slippery. Because a while back, uh, people mostly at Lifeway Christian Resources thought that they would begin to market Beth Moore as though she were a product and uh, like Frankenstein's monster, it got out of control. And so Bice discusses how in 2016 he penned an article titled, Why Your Pastor Should Say No More to Beth Moore. So to be fair, Bice was saying it at least in 2016. And he discusses two primary reasons why Southern Baptists should say literally enough of Beth Moore. And all God's people said, just Southern Baptists? I mean... To be fair, he's targeting the audience to Southern Baptists, but no evangelical should be listening to that crazy-eyed prophetess. Nobody. And so he discusses these two primary hang-ups with Beth Moore. The first is the charismatic associations that she has, uh, and particularly her view of the gifts in which, uh, by that I mean the, the charismatic or the apostolic sign gifts, signs of a true apostle, uh, uh, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And so she's basically claiming direct divine revelation from God. This is what we would call a sign or a wonder, a wonder because it is a prophetic gift that is given in the scripture by the apostolic laying on of hands. So both apostles and those who the apostles laid hands on or upon in the New Testament could hear directly from God like the prophet Agabus. The problem is, Beth Moore claims to have this power. And in Southern Baptist circles, there is still occasionally a raised eyebrow. We call it the skunk eye. Like, what? 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 Are you kidding, are you kidding me? That's not, that's not right. Um, but for the most part, let's be honest, SBC stands for slowly becoming charismatic. And it's not really that slowly, but she has these associations with women who are even worse than she is, like Joyce Meyer, like Christine Kane, like Ann Voskamp, basically like those women promoted at the Gospel Coalition. Did you ever think you would live to see the day if you were around in Reformed Evangelicalism in 2008? Did you ever think that you would live long enough to see the day that Beth Moore would not only be accepted among the evangelical intelligentsia. I'm talking the highfalutin, super smarty pants. They're smarter than the rest of us, like Ed Stetzer and Tim Keller, Russell Moore. Did you ever think that not only you'd live to see the day that she would be accepted, but that she would be the prized cash cow of Bashan, a golden calf that you shouldn't touch or ever criticize? She is now. Also, ecumenism, he brings up. And, and yeah, I don't think that there was, if you're a professing Christian, it doesn't matter what strain of heretic you are, as long as you profess Christ, it doesn't matter if you possess him. Uh, I guess there's more than two. So the, the third one would be SBC and women preachers. And that is, hey, uh, y'all, last time we checked, Southern Baptists weren't into lady preachers. But the problem is the SBC has largely been okay with it. And what we've pointed out here at Pulpit and Pen is that the seminaries are actively recruiting women to receive degrees in pastoral ministry and have graduated them with such degrees in recent years. Women are taking homiletics courses at Southern Baptist seminaries where they're being taught how to preach. And no one goes, hold on a second, why are we doing that? And it's because largely we have believed this stupid myth that women should be teaching and preaching so long as it's to other men, excuse me, women. When in fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 tells women to remain silent within the church and to not usurp authority over a man, why are you teaching at all? Why is there this notion that women must learn from other female preachers? And I've told this story before about how the women in our church said we want to do a women's Bible study, and I'm like, great. Uh, who are we going to use? I mean, there's K. Arthur, I suppose, but Martha Peace, she's really good. Nancy Lee DeMoss, no thanks. Uh, so, who, like, who should we use? Who are the good ones? Susan Heck, maybe? And they were like, why are you only listing women's names? Well, I don't know. It's a women's Bible study. Well, I would think that you would want to learn from a woman. And they looked at me like I was a freaking space alien. They're like, no, we were thinking more like Sproul, 
MacArthur or, and this was their idea, you. Yeah, because it, it doesn't make any sense that women need to learn the Bible from other women because God established the home in which the father slash husband are to be the primary spiritual leaders of the home in which women are learning from their husband. If you have a question, keep it to yourself. Ask your husband later at home. And at church, they're learning from elders who most of us in the SBC still acknowledge are men. So why, why can't women learn why why must women learn from other women but in the SBC we've largely forgotten that uh, altogether and so Bice points out it's a very good article and so I am going to cast some shade at it uh, he says here at the end the SBC is not charismatic it, it frankly is like Ronnie Floyd was the president of IHOP excuse me the president of the SBC speaking at IHOP that's not the uh, the pancake place it's the International House of Prayer and he's casting visions. He's saying, God told me this and that, not at IHOP, but just around. Like he is constantly hearing visions from God almost every week. The Lord told me that we need to focus more on prayer. Like from reading your Bible? No, he means he's an anointed leader. He hears directly from God. That's what Ronnie Floyd means. He is the president now of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. That's J.D. Greer is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, not the president of the executive committee. He's the president, and he is a charismatic, or at least, at the very least, a continuationist. And so the SBC, frankly, is largely a charismatic denomination. And it was David Platt who opened up, yes, the venerable David Platt, uh, honorable, the reverend, the respectable, David Platt, who opened up, uh, mission service to those who speak ecstatic gobbledygook gibberish in their prayer closets, and so then he sa- so it's, it's not a true statement from Bice in the SBC. He says it's not egalitarian. At which point I want to say I guess the definition as to what is egalitarian is quickly fleeting. But Beth Moore would call it misogyny. It's misogyny. And so I was explaining to my kids the other day that. We needn't assume that every ethnicity is the same in order to assume that every ethnicity is equal. Now, before you call me the alt-right, let me explain what I meant by that. If you were to take people and associate them arbitrarily, capriciously, and shallowly into identity groups, which I wouldn't advise because it's not how God does things, but if you were to separate people by their melanin count, you would find out that some have natural tendencies and abilities that others uh, that are prominent, that others have that are maybe recessive. And there are some who have other, and, and I don't just mean taking tests, I mean whether it's physical, mental, whatever, let's not pretend we're exactly the same. The same thing goes for men and women. Let's not pretend we're exactly the same. But then I explain to my children, just because someone is different doesn't imply that they are not equal. Like blacks, for example, have a higher risk of sickle cell anemia. It doesn't mean that they're not equal because it's not our sameness that makes us equal. It's a theological presumption that we are made in the image of God regardless of ethnicity. As a matter of fact, regardless of gender. We have equal value before God. That's what makes us equal, that theological supposition. But in the SBC, the fact is we are largely egalitarian and we are largely charismatic and uh, egalitarianism is not misogyny. Listen, good article from Josh Bias. Congratulations, golf clap to... Josh Bice. However, I I made a comment that was quickly deleted, and I knew it would be, because they can't be associated with pulpit and pen. No. You can't have J.D. Hall comment on your blog. Got to delete that comment right away. At which point I said a great subtitle would be, uh, quote, everything pulpit and pen has been telling you about Beth Moore for the last 10 years. That would make a great subtitle to Bice's post. So here's the thing. If in 2009 you were warning people uh, about Beth Moore, you have props 
when it comes to discernment. That's discerning. That's warning people about the danger before it happens because you are training the powers of your discernment with constant practice so that you might be skilled in the word of righteousness and reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That reproof part requires using scripture to warn someone about a danger before it happens. The rebuke is warning someone with scripture after it happens. All right, But the reproving is warning someone about something before it happens. There were polemicists and discernment ministry guys warning you about Beth Moore as early as 2003, 2004, 2005, Ken Silva, 2008, Pulp and Pen. And I just want to point this out. Most of the folks hosting conferences, like Josh Bice, were psh, psh, uh, totally quiet on that. If in 2009 you were warning people about Beth Moore, that's discernment. If in 2019 you're warning people about Beth Moore, thank you. Keep it up. Continue to warn people. That's not discernment just for the sake of record. That's being Captain Obvious. We all know that now. However, for the last 10 years, evangelical leaders have let people like myself and Chris Rosebro and Ken Silva been beaten to a pulp because we were the only ones criticizing Beth Moore. Very few people were doing it. And somebody's going to say, I was, I was. I... But point is, very few were doing it while most were silent. Listen, I would encourage you that if you aspire to do discernment, start speaking out before the bandwagon literally rolls by your house and stops for you to wait and jump up on the wagon. Can you, can you be discerning before it's too late? Because now we have easily over a decade of Beth Moore's influence in the Southern Baptist Convention because we let other people get thrown under the bus as naysayers and critics and terrible discernment people. And now that's why your claims, your concerns, your issues now, frankly, are largely irrelevant because it's just what we've been writing about for 10 years. Everyone already knows the danger of Beth Moore. So let's go to the next post, uh, numero uh, two, and that is Jim Baker. Let me check in with the admins real quick. All right. Uh, by the way, thank you to the admins, the editors, the contributors, all of you at Polemics Report and Pulpit and Pen for doing what it is that you do. If you'd like to volunteer, that would be great. Send us an email, email volunteer at pulpitandpin.org. I don't, if that doesn't work, I think that works. If not, uh, talk back at pulpitandpin.org and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer. Join us in the pulpit bunker. That's a closed group, but all you have to do to join that is ask this article. Absolutely. I don't even know what to do with it, honestly. Jim Baker, uh, government agencies go after Trump like they went after me. Uh, do you know anything about Jim Baker? We'll get into it. Um, this is from Charisma Mag. If you've been keeping up with the news lately, you know government agencies love to attack President Donald Trump. True story. Just recall how Democrats brought up false accusations about him colluding with the Russians during his election campaign. Thankfully, the Mueller report was a vindication of sorts. Of, of sorts. Technically, what Mueller said was that uh, there was not enough... Uh, evidence to exonerate him that's the that's the quick of it which it's kind of weird because as a prosecutor your job isn't to exonerate it's just to determine whether or not there's enough evidence to prosecute so he came in shady he went he went out shady jim baker then says he can relate to trump because when a newspaper exposed how he had a one night stand full stop stop the stop the bus right now how about this rape not a one night stand a one night stand is not rape. She accused him of rape. Then he used money from his ministry to, to stink and buy her off and buy her silence. Furthermore, the ministry money that was used was actually a timeshare real estate scam, Ponzi scheme. It was fraudulent. Then on top of that, there's all the income that should have been taxed that was not. So he was misusing his 501c3 status, his charitable tax exempt status as a quote-unquote church, to pay women off for having gang raped them with another dude. Allegedly. Now, should I say allegedly? He was convicted. No, I shouldn't say. He was convicted of at least the 
tax evasion part, and it was started by the investigation into what was rape. Not a one-night stand, Charisma News. And so, by God's grace, Jim was in prison only for five years. During that time, God deeply transformed Jim's heart. Now, let me stop here for a moment. What is Jim Baker doing now? He is running a real estate scam of senior citizens in Branson, Missouri, doing pretty much the same thing as he was doing before, except now it has like a doomsday vibe. I don't know if he's raping anybody, but he's on to a different wife. And so um, this is from uh, Mr. Strang, who was on Jim Baker's show as they discussed the similarities between he and Donald Trump. Baker says, Donald Trump and I have so much in common. He had every agency of government trying to destroy him, and a couple months ago he was exonerated. They still don't want him to be exonerated. And so he compares himself to Trump, and he says, when they put me in prison, they brought in the Postal Department, the IRS, every agency of government I could go on and on, he says. Well, that's because you were violating all of those laws, Jim Baker. So the last thing Donald Trump should want is the most notorious false teaching of alleged rapist. I'm a little bit worried about being sued these days. Uh, probably not by Jim Baker. Uh, this is again, this isn't new. Can, like if you could just relive the eighties for like the last part of the eighties for a minute. Um, don't compare Donald Trump to you if you're trying to help him because you weren't exonerated. Why am I talking to you? I wish I could have, don't you wish instead of shouting into a, a, a microphone, you could have a real conversation like face to face with a like Jim Baker. Don't you wish that you could just have a, just call him out just once? Uh, oh, yeah, I did that. Hold on a second. Let me play this. Yeah. Your dream gave me 50 dreams. <laughs> because of your one dream, I had 50 dreams of what we can do. Jim Baker, you claim to have a dream. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 20 through 22 says that if anyone says they're a prophet, but they prophesy something that is not true, that they're a false prophet and they prophesy presumptuously. What happened to the Shemitah? What happened to your four blood moons? What happened to your prophecies you said were coming in September of 2015? What happened, what happened to the cow with the number seven on its head? <laughs> this one was, uh, there was a cow with the number seven on its head. Like it, it, it was a spot. I don't know if it was a Jersey cow or what, but it, it was a spot on its head that roughly looked like the number seven. And so he said this stood for the seven years of famine because of, you know, Joseph's dream, the skinny count. I'm like, why not the seven years of feast? I don't know, which. why is it the seven years of famine? Why didn't anybody warn us at the beginning of the seven years of feasting to start saving up for the seven years of fasting? Anyways, I went out to my friend's house who had cows, and I found a cow with the number, uh, was it three? With some number on its head. What does this symbolize? This is called omen interpretation nonsense. So I happen to be there. At Morningside, is that what it's called? Morningside, something. Uh, it, it, I wrote about it. You can find it online. 89,000 views. So I, I'm having this conversation. You claim to have had a dream. What happened to the Shemitah year? Where was that great economic shaking that we were all promised? What happened to the four blood moons? Where's it at, Jim? Where's it at, Jim? That's his uh, grandson coming down to rough me up. You must listen to the men of God. The men of... No, Deuteronomy 18 just said, if you have ever prophesied falsely and it doesn't come to pass, I'm to no longer respect you. I'm forbidden by God from ever listening to ever, anything that you ever said or will ever say again. From now on, I can't trust any prophecy because you've been wrong and then one of his producers are like now's not the time to speak son no don't touch my camera and don't touch my person so they're like 
confiscate his camera. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So I, I picked a seat at the front of the crowd because security was in the back, and they would have to wave, uh, wade through a sea of octogenarians to get to me, and they'd have to toss some tables and probably send some old people to the hospital. I think I was the youngest person there by close to 50 years. And so now he's doing the same scam, but to, to young people, I mean to old people, it's, it's very, basically the same people he was scanning in the 80s to be quite honest with you, literally the, the same crowd. Um, crazy. Uh, number three, third news story of the day. Um, Georgia Church adds a psychic medium uh, to their ministry staff from pulpitandpen.org. Check us out online, pulpitandpen.org. By the way, Facebook throttles us all the time. And so what that means is you, you don't expect to see Pulpit and Pen just show up in the news feed. You have to go looking for it on, and go directly to the website too, uh, not just from Facebook or Twitter, but pulpitandpen.org. Before I get to this, I better get to a uh, commercial break. This message is brought to you by crownandcross.org, where we provide rare books from some of the greatest minds of the Christian faith. We also provide children's books, resources to help your children grow in the faith. Our goal is to help you grow in holiness to the Lord. So please visit crownandcross.org. This message is brought to you by crownandcross.org, where we provide rare books from some of the... All right, all right, sorry, sorry. I'm still trying to figure out the uh, the technology here. Uh, Georgia Church adds a psychic medium to their ministry staff. And you're thinking, well, hold on a second. Bethel's not in red. Bethel's in ready. It's not in Georgia. What is this? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so here's what... Uh, yeah, my admins are telling me, boost myself, lower the video volume, as though I know how to do that. I've, I'll try not to talk over it. Sorry. We'll make adjustments, as always. Um, this isn't satire, but it sounds like it. Um, the Vision Church of Atlanta, Georgia, has added an actual, honest-to-goodness, psychic medium. Well, there's nothing honest or good about a psychic medium, but she claims to actually be a psychic medium. And uh, they have, oh, I forgot to put on the podcast sports coat. Sorry, I was told that uh, I look much more handsome in that, and, and professional. Uh, her name is LaCara Foster. And those of you listening on the podcast at Bible Thumping Wingnut can't see it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, she claims to be able to communicate with the dead. The church licensed her to the gospel ministry, in theory, and hired her as staff so that she can help parishioners communicate with their deceased relatives. I kid you not. Uh, we have a video of LaCara Foster exercising what she calls a spiritual gift. By the way, she said, quote, I kept my gift of psychic mediumship a secret from my family and friends for a long time. Her dissertation was on why being a psychic medium is actually a spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit. I, again, I file it under, I kid you not. So here's uh, LaCara Le- Foster using her uh, spiritual uh, gift. My brother? Okay. Um, your grandmother is bringing him through. Was he was he troubled in his mind? As opposed to all the people who are not troubled in their mind. Uh, hold on a second. I'm getting something. Do you have back problems? <laughs> yes. Everyone has back problems. Uh, hold on a second. I'm... I'm I'm feeling something. Do you have money issues? <laughs> yeah, hold on. I, I'm starting to feel something. Mm, do you have relationship problems? All right. This is what you call cold reading. Just so you know, this is cold reading. Like, if you listen to a mentalist like Chris Angel, they will explain to you in vivid detail how Benny Hinn and, uh, and how Peter Popoff and how... Uh, Todd White, do their quote-unquote healing hocus-pocus. Well, similarly, a mentalist can teach you how to do what she's doing. This is called the cold reading. Yes, okay. Like, I don't know if he was diagnosed with something. Was it like um, schizophrenia or like bipolar or something? I don't know if he was. Why don't you know? You're talking to him. He's in the spirit realm, lady. He's communicating. Just ask him. Be like, hey, were you diagnosed with I don't know if he was diagnosed with anything so that if he says yes, she'll be like, aha, see? But if he says no, she's like, well, I said I didn't know if he was diagnosed 
Was she was he diagnosed with something like schizophrenia or no PTSD? Okay. And and then he volunteers the PTSD. This is like a sleight of hand trip. She doesn't volunteer the PTSD. She volunteered information that was wrong. He then says PTSD, and she's like, oh, okay. Like, I knew it was something like that. He volunteered the information. She provides none of it. Okay. He's just saying, like, like he couldn't get it together. Um, was he military? Yes. That might have been a clue from the PTSD. Do you see, do you see what is happening here? Like, we all get to, He's got PTSD. Ah. Uh. Was he in the military? Why not? He was in the military as a definitive. Was he in the military? So you see what's happening here. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, how did you know that? Because you said he had PTSD and it typically happens from IEDs, you crazy lun lunatic. So uh, anyways, in her uh, dissertation, uh, she said uh, one of the reasons uh, she is doing this is she had pursued her doctorate on this topic because she really wanted to understand her gift from the intersections intersectionality of afrocentrism and christianity so don't complain about this you racists you're gonna have beth moore's like misogynist and then you have kyle j howard who's like he's a it. <laughs> and and you're just gonna be shouted out of the room so don't say anything about it you alt-right this is this is her ethnic heritage. And why the church believes this gift shouldn't be considered a spiritual gift among those listed in the Bible. Well, I know why it shouldn't be considered a spiritual gift among those listed in the Bible. Because it's not a spiritual gift list listed among those in the Bible. Do I get a prize for this? Or cookie? From anybody? No. Uh, Leviticus 19.31. Do not turn to mediums and necromancers. That's people who talk to the dead. Do not seek them out and make yourselves unclean by them. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 through 12. When you come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, you should not learn to follow the abominable, abominable practices of those nations. And then it mentions them, including those who practice divination, tell fortunes, or interpret omens, or a sorcerer, sorcerer or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. And I, I, did you have a? Uh, do you have a male relative? <laughs> do you have a male relative? Did he have like what he would call issues? Okay, so I'm talking to him right now, and he says that you're you're one of the people he knew. Is that right? Okay, and he did something with his with, for a living, and he. He, did he work with his hands? Right, as opposed to all the people who work with their feet. And, okay, so take that person, right, and stone them to death. Drive them out of the land altogether. A man or a woman, Leviticus twenty two twenty seven, who's a medium or a necromancer, shall surely be put to death. Now, why isn't this one of the spiritual gifts? Because then we'd have to kill you for it. If we were in the Old Testament civil religion of Israel, and we're not, this isn't the body politic of Israel, uh, so thank God for that. Although when Jesus comes back, he, he might reinstitute that. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work. But uh, I would say good luck, but luck is probably the wrong word to use with a medium and necromancer and fortune teller. Here's what I want to point out. How is this woman and what she's teaching any different than what is regularly taught at Bethel Church? Those crazy lunatics claim to talk to the dead, too. I was having a conversation with Oral Roberts the other day. And Smith Wigglesworth came and talked to me in a dream, and uh, they, claim, they, they do this soul-sucking necromancy talking to the dead constantly. They claim to be able to read minds. Uh, is there somebody out there? Put your hand up. Does somebody out there have erectile dysfunction? Uh, put your hand on the television, and you shall be healed. This is the same type of cold reading nonsense that is done by Bill Johnson at Bethel Church in Redding, California. The only difference is he's smart enough not to call it being a medium or being psychic. He, he just flat out calls it a spiritual gift. So that being the case, let me get to um, some sincere questions while I, I'm thinking about it. 
I'm not going to say his name, but to whom it may concern, I posted in the pulpit bunker recently about a situation in which I confronted one of my elders about quoting Ann Voskamp favorably in a sermon. He said he would discuss anything I may disagree with, but would not discuss Voskamp outside the one quote. The file attached, I don't want to get into that. Um, He found it, that is his complaint, to be adversarial and potentially divisive. And I assured him that was not the case. Now, if this was me, I would then politely inform your pastor that you consider the quotation from Ann Voskamp to be potentially divisive. And then I would share your intentions that if he continues to quote women who think that they've had sex with God, that you will potentially divide over that issue. And you might divide him from his paycheck. But here's what I wanted to get to. If you quote someone, you don't have a right. You shouldn't. No, you don't. You don't have a right within the the body of the church to say, I'm only going to discuss this one quotation. As though you have found the one quotation from the person that isn't problematic. So we have to be careful who we quote. Do you want... Uh, Mike Abendroth did a great piece at his website, which is, uh, what's it called? No Co Radio, where he says, can we stop quoting C.S. Lewis? And I still quote C.S. Lewis. So I didn't, uh, but, but infrequently, and I do so with an asterisk, usually. And the point is, you, it's unfair to say, I'm stripping this quotation away from this smart person and I'm using it uh, and you don't have a right to question whether or not that's a good source because of this crazy insane crap that they said over here Uh, it's like quoting GK Chesterton okay he had some smart things do you want to promote the Roman Catholicism too or no you're not okay with that so maybe so whereas I'm not advocating that a single parishioner or church member should have the ability to censor the pastor, You're, you need to have a conversation about what that person represents. There are songs by Hillsong that are not that bad, but it's tied to the mothership of the New Apostolic Reformation, so we're not going to deal with it. We're not seeing it. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't answer that question last time. There's a chance I might have. I forget. Um, uh, this is from William McColl. Uh, God told me to warn all you false prophets to stop feeding off God's people or in hell will be your reward. So God told him to, to warn all you false prophets. I don't believe in prophecy today. I'm a cessationist. So if God told you to tell me to stop prophesying, you misunderstood him and you've prophesied presumptuously and I'm not supposed to listen to anything that you've ever said ever again. And so I said, I stopped reading after God told me, which is my patented response. And so um, something about there is an asteroid that will hit. Oh, I forgot that part. I never read it, actually. This is the first time I'm reading it because I really do stop reading after. I'm reading it for the first time now in the program. There is an asteroid that will hit the Pacific Ocean soon. That will be your only warning if you ignore this. Sell that private jet and help people, or demons will come to claim your soul in hell. It's going to be hard when they're burning, too. God is tired uh, and ready to reset his creation again. Okay, so God doesn't tire. Just, you know, the attributes of, uh, of God. And so when I said I stopped reading after God told me, William responded, yet where is the chapter and verse of how God wanted you? Because I asked for a chapter and verse. God wanted you to have a $20 million airplane, at which point I responded, I think you're thinking of someone else. I don't want a $20 million airplane. And he says, look, I don't create my own message. I just deliver it. Uh, I think it speaks for itself. Although I would hate to sell my $20 million airplane. Uh, this, this email I thought was um, funny. I don't think it was meant to be funny. This is from Jennifer. She is a 75-year-old woman. I don't think I know any 75-year-olds named Jennifer. That was kind of forward-thinking of your parents. 
I'll keep it pithy. I'm a 75-year-old woman who was saved and delivered after being involved in uh, adultery many years ago. God took my mess, turned it into a message, and given me a ministry. I knew in my spirit that Beth Moore was a false teacher. My personal goal... <laughs> Sorry. I'm losing it again. Uh, I knew... <laughs> I'm not making fun. I just thought it was... Okay, I'm, I'm, I might be making fun. But it's funny. I'm making it funny. Um, my personal goal has been... <laughs> to, my personal goal has been to be the anus of... <laughs> My personal goal has been to be the anus of the body. Very important part, but never seen. Everybody needs to be in the anus. And I was called, I'm not going to say it, many times when I was growing up. And maybe God took what uh, Satan meant for evil and has turned it into, God, into good. And so, she, if, every member, if every Christian is a body part, maybe she's the anus. And I would... <clears throat> I'm going to make some some loving suggestions. Let's go for liver because uh, it it filters out toxins as, as opposed to the anus that expels weights, waste. I'm just saying, if, as long as you get to pick, be the, the liver. What does the pancreas do? I know a lot of people that are appendices. Append, appendixes? No. Appendicitis would be an appendix. Appendicize. Appendicize? Appendix? Appendixes. That doesn't sound right. If you can pick anything, don't don't pick the rectum or anything. I'm just, I'm going to make a suggestion. Uh, the next one is from, so this is the, thank you for your emails. It keeps me active. Brothers, I am a pastor of a Southern Baptist church in Northern California. I've been made aware of the SBC shocking unfaithfulness. Do you have any advice for a church leaving the Southern Baptist Convention? Are there certain things we need to do to be removed from their roles? Thank you for your time for the furtherance of the kingdom. Uh, I'll withhold the name of the church because uh, that's probably a church decision. Yes, good question. First of all, if you do not notify them, you will forever be on their rolls. Secondly, even if you do notify them, you will probably forever be on their rolls. Our church is still listed uh, on the Southern Baptist Church website directory. We're still listed in the animal church profile. We still get their garbage. We're still in their eyes a Southern Baptist Church, even though we sent to the executive committee uh, a Dear John letter. And even though I preached a sermon about why we were leaving the convention and it's had like 10,000 views. And even though they know darn well that I'm the most contrarian pastor in the Southern Baptist convention or was, they will not remove us from their roles because they lust after numbers. So my advice is to send a letter to the executive committee of the Southern Baptist convention but line out your concerns and say, we can't partner, partner over this. It's the same advice I gave to Mike Fix over at Capitol Heights Baptist Church. By the way, I'm going to be there June 9 for uh, two lectures on social justice. I think June 9. Uh, check out uh, my Facebook page or their fa Facebook page, Capitol Heights Baptist Church. I said, if you leave, don't leave silently. Preach a sermon, why? And post it online, which he did. And uh, don't, don't go quietly. With your association or state convention, it depends on your association and state convention. It could be a matter of just not sending them money and not filling out the APC, the annual church profile. So it's, it's, listen, the Southern Baptist Convention is like the typical Southern Baptist church that never purges it. It's rolls. And so you have dead people that are technically members of the church. We have 800 members. Yeah, but four people show up on Sunday morning. That's the Southern Baptist Convention. Could you imagine the hemorrhage of the numbers that they presented? Because uh, last week they said, again, the Southern Baptist Convention is at a 30-year low. Um, <clears throat> so not only are they declining, they're declining super fast. Could you imagine the numbers if they didn't fudge and lie about it? If they actually removed the churches that no longer wanted to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention? I'm preaching at churches this summer like next month in the Bible Belt that, uh, well, in July, in the Bible Belt 
that are Southern Baptist churches, a string of them, technically, but they have not given to the convention in several years and plan to never show up at a meeting ever again and uh, would, would do not really personally consider themselves a cooperating Southern Baptist. And I don't think anyone knows. And so there's a bunch of churches who are like, I'm not giving you any more money. We're not doing it. Like, we're not even buying Lifeway literature. We're out. And they're still counting all of them. Now, if you're having a problem uh, with, with baptism numbers, uh, with new membership, would it not make sense that you would focus on, now hear me out, gospel and evangelism? I know. Evangelism, missions, the gospel... You would think that we would be training our members in way of the master style. What I mean by that is law and gospel, evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus with our friends and neighbors and loved ones, making sure that we can we have members who can articulate their faith and share that with their loved ones. No, no, no. The Southern Baptist Convention says, hey, Russ, uh, Russ Moore, come over here. And then uh, Moeller, yeah, bring your boys over here. Uh, let's let's uh, let's elect the uh, the hipster in the skinny jeans. and the, No, the one with the tight T-shirt, J.D. J.D. JD grew over here. What do we need to focus on, guys? And they, they bring in the smart guys. They're like, I don't know, let's ask Ed. Ed, Ed Stesser, what should we do? Oh, social justice? Okay, let's focus on social justice. Social religion. So what made the mainstream denominations decline? Social religion. So our denomination is declining at record pace. Hey guys, what do we need to focus on? Social religion? Yeah, a bunch of geniuses. We, we're just a bunch of dummies out here in the middle of nowhere. We don't know what we're talking about. We thought the solution might be the gospel and stuff, and y'all are focused on social gospel. Just The Southern Baptist Convention is led by gaggle of idiots. Uh... Patrick says, uh, I hope you can answer my sincere question with a biblical answer. Actually, no, I'm going to save that one for next time because I actually I can't answer that. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Deborah, uh, hey, just listen to the video between Cody and JD on discernment. I wanted to say it was very uplifting to me. If you missed that, you can find it somewhere. Uh, look hard. I've been a follower of Pulpit and Pen for quite some time, much to the disdain. I think it's on the Bible Thumping Wing Nut YouTube channel and Facebook and Cody's Facebook and Pulpit and Pen. Not sure. Oh, by the way, if you if you subscribe as a subscriber, uh, no, 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 as a supporter on Facebook twice a week starting tomorrow, I think you're going to get videos of Cody and I uh, just chatting uh, about the news of the day, just very informally. Uh, Cody is the uh, communications uh, media manager for Pulpit and Pen, and uh, we'll we'll rant about liberals and uh, the LGBT and you know politically incorrect stuff like that. That'll probably no doubt get us kicked off of Facebook, and he will have done a horrible job as a communications and media manager. Um, and, oh, those videos will be uploaded to Patreon. So if you're a supporter at Patreon, you'll get those videos. Don't support us on Facebook if you're already supporting us on Patreon. If you don't want to bother signing up for the lowest level of subscription on Patreon, you can do it right there on Facebook. She says, I've been a follower of Pulp and Pin for quite some time, much to the disdain of my many friends. You see, they don't like JD's tone or what appears to be, uh, what appears to them to be a chip on his shoulder or his prideful attitude, or will you get the point, fill in the blank. I just wanted to say that I enjoy all of what Pulpit and Pin stands for and believe wholeheartedly that the team is the Rolex of discernment ministries, as JD would say. I've learned so much from you guys and continue to stand up and defend what you do. I'll always tell my PNP detractors that you've never been wrong about anything. Anything. And by the way, we have. We've been wrong about a few things. It happens because we're not perfect because um, Jesus was for us. Uh, vicariously in our place. By the way, do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is that Christ Jesus died according to the scriptures that he was buried and he rose again from the dead. He vicariously died as a substitute for individual sinners who would believe in him, who happened to be the same ones who God the Father elected and who God the Son died for and God the Spirit calls and convicts and to whom we are given faith. And he took our sin 
so that we could receive the righteousness that he earned for us uh, through his active obedience in his life and the passive obedience that he endured while on the cross. Uh, that's the good news of the gospel. So if you believe in that, repent of your sins and be baptized. Um, in fact, she says, I tell them you've always been able to report accurately on events way before anyone else is thinking about it. Thank you. And it's true. Still, they refuse to acknowledge discernment for what it is. And I just have to shake my head. It's the anti polemics cognitive dissidence syndrome mentioned in the video. Love the drought moisture analogy because it's absolutely fitting. And you can listen to the video to figure out what that was. All uh, that to say, thank you, Pulp and Pin, for what you do. The great apostasy is happening before our eyes, and I pray that the Lord come quickly every day. As he tarries, I just want you to know that J.D. is already at the cool table, and the gate is narrow. And such are the low number of people who join you at that table. Can't wait to see you all in heaven. Well, amen and amen. Thank you for your encouragement. This is from Nancy, who says, I am in tears of gratitude for J.D. Hall's uh, message, The Doctrine of Separation. Short testimony. I've recently had to separate from the church I had been attending for eight years. The pastor began embracing false doctrines slowly, word of faith, name it and claim it, dominionism, nar teaching. Each time at the beginning, the Lord led me to go directly to him and show him the error of scripture, and he would see it and correct it. But never before the congregation, he never addressed it with them. So she's kind of calling him out in error, and he's not... Like he's acknowledging it, but still leaving the fog in the pulpit so there's mist in the pew and the congregation no doubt will be confused. And uh, anyway, she left the church over dominionism and NAR teaching. And she said, after much testing it and praying, I could see the errors and its association with C. Peter Wagner being the biggest issue. Anyways, at that point, it was clear that he was no longer open to correction at all. And so... Um, <clears throat> She, I tried to bring her along to cessationism. She left the charismatic church over the New Apostolic Reformation and its association with C. Peter Wagner and dominionism, and that's good. I haven't been able to pull Nancy away from charismaticism yet. Do you know what cessationism is? Cessationism is our belief that the apostolic sign gifts were sign gifts given to the apostles, as the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. Am I correctly citing that? Is it 2.12? 12. 12, 12. Somebody posted on the thread. We've demonstrated among you signs of a true apostle, miracles, wonders, and mighty deeds, I think is how it's phrased in the ESV. And so we would argue that these miraculous gifts, for lack of a better word, the charismata, or in some cases, Doria, the gifts given to verify the validity of the apostles and their message, have passed away with the apostles. Just as there was a time of silence between Malachi and Matthew, once the Old Testament canon was closed, now we have a time of silence from John, the revelator, to today because the canon is closed. So if God didn't speak in the interim, between Malachi and Matthew, why are we expecting God to speak now? So now when we say, God led me, we need to mean the Holy Spirit led me through my knowledge of Scripture and the illumination of my mind to do this or that, and then to add a very careful, so I think, or better yet, just say, uh, the Scripture says, and leave it at that, and not make claims of continued prophecy and revelation. So, here is my encouragement to you charismatics that say, well, I'm a charismatic, but I'm not one of those nar charismatics. I would say lovingly, as long as you're a charismatic and that charismatic window is open, meaning that you're, you're a cautious continuationist, you're open to continued revelation, but you're cautious about it, you will never find a church that is immune to charismatic claims. And, uh, and by that, let me back up. What, you'll never find a church that's immune to the excesses of the charismatic until you find a church, uh, the charismatic movement, until you find a church that is closed to the charismatic movement. As long as you're open to it, the window is open and any garbage that wants to can just come right into the church. Any false teacher can climb right through the window because you're open to it. Shut the window. 
Clo- close it. Be like, okay, listen, here's the rule for our church. If you want to say God said so, you point to a chapter and verse. You say, this is where God says. And then if you feel led to say something, you don't cast that on God the Spirit as though you're inspired, as though you're an apostle. You say, I think or I feel as opposed to God said. And when you do that, then and only then do you have this window shut where this garbage isn't going to come in and out. I just say that because over and over and over again, I've, I've got these emails from charismatics who flee a charismatic church that's inundated with the New Apostolic Reformation into a different charismatic church. They're like, whew, none of that Kenneth Copeland junk here. Who's speaking next month? Rodney Howard Brown, say what? Uh, and then it swallows up that church. And then the, the, the NAR is swallowing up churches. You're, it's like trying to run from the great nothing in never-ending story. It's just going to swallow up your charismatic church hole. You have to get out now. Leave it all behind. Find a church that teaches that uh, God, the Holy Spirit, still convicts us of sin. He still leads us to the knowledge of truth. He still gives us spiritual gifts. He still produces in us spiritual fruit. He still gives us faith to believe. He still, you know, he does all of these roles and things. But there's no gifts designating apostleship because there's. That, that's right. You guessed, guessed it. There's no apostles. So find a good church. By the way, the reason we do this program is for local churches to equip local churches. Are you a member of a biblical New Testament church? It would be our worst nightmare for you to say, after listening to Polemics Report, I've decided there are no good churches. I'm going to stay home. Uh, you would be in sin. Go fellowship with those who you have to fellowship that's the wrong way of phrasing it. Sojourn with those you have to sojourn with. Uh, you got to be somewhere. And so find the best you can, be a part of it, and use the spiritual gift of discernment to be the liver <clears throat> of that church, if necessary, uh, excreting waste from the system uh, of the body. And that's why nobody likes plummets because we're basically the liver. Thanks for listening to Polemics Report, everybody. Uh, support us on Patreon if you can. Go fund me. Uh, the book is almost wrapped up. I'm excited about that. Uh, uh, UngodlyMessTheBook.com. Check that out there. Support us and share our stuff. Thanks, everybody. God bless you. Talk to you next time. Until then, as always. Simper. This podcast is part of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Network. Biblical Christianity's marketplace of ideas. BibleThumpingWingnut.com